This is a beginner's guide to bandsaws. We've got Mr. D. Schrenner here from Woodcraft in the south location of Houston. He's going to teach us all about the bandsaws. D, thank you for having us. Morning. Morning. What's the first thing we need to know about a bandsaw? What's the first thing? Safety. safety. Always safety. The bandsaw, in fact, is probably one of the safer power tools that can be used in the shop. That is simply because with the new modern bandsaws and the fence options that you now have, when you're cutting thin stock, you can lay your fence down nice and low to the table, lower your guide arm down nice and close to your workpiece. Say this is my workpiece that I want to saw. So you can see I have the guides just as, as low as I need. And there's minimal amount of blade exposed. So we help to prevent cutting fingers off. So when you're operating a bandsaw, you want this guide arm as low as possible in yes, most cases? Yes, you want it as close as possible to your workpiece. Serves two purposes. Obviously safety, keeping your fingers away, but also it keeps that band distance that's cutting as short as possible to prevent any kind of deflection because there's also a set of these guides underneath the table which are also guiding the band. And so if we can keep that distance at a, at a very minimal, we'll get good guiding of our band and, and no deflection. Awesome. On this particular brand of bandsaw, Laguna has seen the foresight to add a foot brake. I'm going to go ahead and start this saw up. Now, if I were just to normally shut this saw off, you can see how long the blade is going to just continue to run and, and just free, free run and free run and free run. But with the foot brake, which is a combination of a disc brake that stops the wheel and also a switch which cuts the power, I can stop this blade in a significantly shorter time. Yep, I like that. My Rikon doesn't have that. It right. just spins and spins and spins. Right. Like it, it takes a significant takes, amount of time. Exactly. So you have to really be mindful of that blade is still moving. Yep, you don't want to be reaching in there. Yeah. Uh, Tip number two. So on our, on our band saws, this is, a, this is a pretty middle of the road size. This is a 14 inch band saw. Now, when the manufacturers refer to a 14 inch band saw, they're referring to the distance from the column to the band in other words, how deep can we cut? Not how tall. Not how far. That is typically in the specification sheet, and that is referred to as a resaw capacity. That means how far can we go from the thinnest down on the table to the maximum thickness of a workpiece that we can cut on the bandsaw. So when we're set up like this, we're typically looking to make big resaws, in other words, making very thin stock like your own shop veneer, or cutting big bowl blanks, getting ready to go onto the lathe or something like that. Obviously in this position, we have a lot of teeth exposed in the wood. This is where the horsepower of the bandsaw is really be, is demanded. Yeah. So again, based upon the things that you think you want to do in your shop, you need to pick a bandsaw with the appropriate amount of horsepower to be able to accomplish those tasks. What's this? This is a Laguna 14BX. What's the horsepower? This one is at rated at two and a half horsepower. And this is a 220 volt machine. Okay. Right next door is the exact same saw, just a one and three quarter horsepower, but a 110 volt machine. Gotcha. So this one can go into most guys' shop without any addition to their shop because most everybody has 110. Right. One question I get a lot is what is a good budget option, not necessarily like brand or a specific bandsaw, but a lot of people are looking for a bandsaw under a thousand dollars. What would you recommend there? Uh, you're going to have to bump it just a little bit if you want to stay in the 14 inch range, probably somewhere between the 12, 13, 1400 dollars is where you're going to find a good choice from the major manufacturers of bandsaws. Jet, Laguna, Rikon, those manufacturers all have a, a similarly sized, similarly featured bandsaw, and they're all competing in right in that price range. Okay, so under $1,000 would be more hobbyist level? 
Under $1,000 is, yes, more hobbyist level, simply because that's typically going to be a bench style bandsaw now. So we're going to see less horsepower, less capability as far as depth here, less capability as far as resaw, and that is basically because you just don't have that much horsepower right. available. So those are really small parts, things like that? Those are small, like hobbyists, like right. model builders. Uh, uh, we have some customers that, uh, some gals that like to make uh, jewelry and small boxes and things like that. Pieces that are anywhere from an eighth of an inch up to maybe inch and a half thick, where you're maybe doing a lot of scrolling or not a lot of curve work because right. those bandsaws work very nicely there. They're much more compact. You can get them on a bench. You can get a little bit closer to them. In that range, Rikon makes a wonderful bandsaw for about $600, $700. Okay. Well-featured, good horsepower, good warranty. Do you all have that one in the store? And we, have that, we carry that one in the store, okay. yeah. Good blade range so that you can go from very small blades up to a pretty substantial, I think somewhere around half or three-eighths wide blade will run on that saw. That's a good saw in that hobbyist, a little bit, un, like say, the under $1,000. Nice. All right, so what about blades? That's one of the more common questions I get is what blade or blades do I need for my bandsaw? We have this particular bandsaw set up with a carbide tipped Laguna Resaw King. Now, this, this is designed, as the name implicates, to doing resawing. It is, really doesn't work well to do curve work on it because you can see the width of the blade. Just, just doesn't allow you to do a lot of uh, sharp curve work. It will cut some, but just not really tight. So it shines in cutting resawing. So here's a couple examples of some resaw pieces that I took off of that bandsaw. You can see the thickness. We're down around in the two millimeter thickness. Mm -hmm. And it's very even. Like and it's, and very, it's very, very even. Cut. It's got a pretty nice uh, finish mm -hmm. right straight off the blade. This blade, again, is specifically designed to do resawing. It is classified as a 2-3 variable pitch. That meaning that the distance between the blades varies as you go along here. If you look real close, you can see that these two teeth are at a 2 teeth per inch. Then right next to it are two teeth that are at 3 teeth per inch. Then 2 teeth per inch, 3 teeth per inch, as it goes all the way around the blade. This helps to prevent some harmonics which affects the quality of the finish when you're making resaws. So this is, this is the largest width blade and as far as capacity that this saw will handle. Now, there are some other blades that you certainly probably want to put into your arsenal. Uh, so this, is a, this again is a 3 quarter inch 2-3, but it is not carbide tipped. So this, this is a, a choice that you would want to make based upon your budget capabilities. So is the carbide more expensive than the this? The carbide is three times more expensive, but it probably will last 10 times right. longer than a standard steel blade. And uh, this can be sent back to the manufacturer for up to two resharpenings. So if you want to do the economics, the pure right. economics, yes, this is a more, this is a more economical blade for the life of the bandsaw. But again, some people are just, they haven't done their economics yet, right. and so. Or they may not have the budget at the or time. Or they may not have the budget at the time yeah. to make that investment. Right. But once you get into this, you're certainly gonna see the benefits down the road. So what does one like this cost? So this, this blade is $58. And what does this cost? That one is 150. Okay, so yeah, it's quite a bit more. Quite a bit more, yes. So this is the same, same width capacity. So if you look on the back of the box, Timberwolf does an excellent job of telling you about the various applications of their blades, their tooth profile, what the minimum radius that you can cut, uh, the types of cuts, whether it's dry wood or green wood. They also have a very specific tensioning routine, and it's here specified here on, on their box, it, versus using the tension gauge, which is equipped in most of the bandsaws right. these days. This is a visual tensioning process. Uh, very easy to do, and once you get used to it, it's, it's very easy to replicate. If you're looking for a kind of a do-it-all blade, 
My recommendations for a 14 inch bandsaw is a 3 8 wide blade. And Timberwolf makes a really great 3 8 wide blade. The other advantage to this particular blade is that the thickness of the, of the blade itself is now at 32 thousandths versus the thickness of all the other blades that they make at 25 thousandths. So, so the blade is a little thicker, a little more sturdy. They actually recommend this for cutting green wood like bowl blanks, yeah. just because you may be running into bark and who knows what kind of nasties. This extra stiff blade works really, really well. Again, it has only three teeth per inch, so it can take a pretty good aggressive cut. When we start talking about TPI or teeth per inch, obviously that refers to the number of teeth in an inch of the blade. So the, the fewer the number here is, the fewer the TPI means we have more space between the teeth, more gullet space, more place for the chips to be evacuated out of the cut. The cuts can be a little rougher, but you, you get the chips out of the cut quicker and faster versus here's a smaller blade with a quarter inch and only six teeth per inch. And it's thinner. And it's thinner. This, so we're back to the 25,000 thickness. And blades like, bl blades like this that are um, thinner, quarter inch width, they're better for curves, things yeah, like that? Yeah, because if you go back here and look at your chart, see I can cut a 5 8 radius with a quarter inch blade. Compare that down to say we go to a half inch blade the smallest radius we can cut is two and a half oh, wow. inches. So Quite a bit of that's a big, big difference. Mm -hmm. So if you find yourself wanting to do a lot of tight curves, you're gonna to need to go to a smaller blade. Let me, let me interject one really cool accessory for band saws that was developed by Carter Products. I'm a fan of Carter, I have their setup blocks. Okay. This is what they call their stabilized, blade stabilizer. So if we compare the way that the blade is supported, here we're supported by wheels. We cannot twist the blade in order to make tight curves. When the blade is used with the blade stabilizer, that groove fits in the back of the blade, and now it allows the blade to twist very easily and stay in that groove. Now remember, this is on a three quarter inch blade. The right. actual application would be something like a three sixteenths or a quarter inch blade. Yeah, much thinner blade. Much, much narrower Narrow. blade. So where does that attach to? This, this just replaces the upper guide. Okay. So you would just take your upper guides off, slip this on in its place, you, you remove, you pull the lower guides away. You don't want them to be in, in the in the way at all. And you just, when you use this, you put a little bit of what they call forward preload on mm -hmm. this to keep the blade nice and tight in that groove. So right. applications for this, bandsaw boxes. Bandsaw boxes are one of the most fun projects mm -hmm. that you can do on bandsaws. Your imagination can just run wild with bandsaw boxes. That's probably the, the biggest advantage. If you wanna make 3D objects, this works really great for that because again, you're doing a lot of scrolling and curve work. A great addition to your bandsaw to give it more functionality. Uh, as most things in woodworking, setup is key to most successful projects, right? And Absolutely. So I would assume it's the same for the bandsaw. Yes, even more so with the bandsaw. So there are about f a half a dozen things that need to be set up and maintained on your bandsaw to keep it running properly and give you good cuts. Your owner's manual is going to run you through all of this, but I'm gonna just basically touch on some, a few things quickly. The bandsaw blade will track on, on the wheels, and that adjustment is made by this knob on the back, and what it does is it takes the top wheel and tilts it left or forward or back. Mm -hmm. So I have this three-quarter inch blade set on the back edge of the urethane. For me, it's a good, comfortable location for this band. I've got a lot of support for the band on the tire. So once we get the tracking set, we're gonna to wanna to set the tension. And those two kind of operate at the same time. You're gonna set both of those at the same time. 
And you're going to go through that process that was specified here for your low tension blades. After you get the tension and the tracking set, the next thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to set up your side guide clearances and your back guide clearances. And on this particular bandsaw, we have actually upgraded from the stock ceramic blade guide set. And that ceramic block looks something like this with two ceramic blocks in here. And, and they actually touch the side of the blade as well as a ceramic insert on the, for the back guide. Again, we, uh, we sell a lot of Carter products, and this is a product that uh, a lot of people have asked for, and so we decided to retrofit one of our bandsaws with that product. This is a bearing guide system. Uh, again, it's very easy to set up. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna get, establish a clearance between the side guides and the bearings. There's a number of ways you can do that. My favorite way is just to take a piece of paper, put it between the bearing and the side of the blade, slide the guide up, lock it in place. Do that on both sides. That's gonna give you about a three to five thousandths clearance on the blade, which is plenty good. The idea is not to have the bearings running all the time when there's no load on the blade. You'll see the bearings run once you place load on it. By having only three to five thousandths of clearance, you're going to have, you're going to keep that blade nice and straight. What's the main benefit of these bearing guides versus the ceramic guides? The bearing guides are, are, are going to rotate. The ceramic guides are going to rub on the blade. And I don't care what anybody says, anything that rubs on steel yeah. is friction. That's and right. friction is heat. Yeah. And heat's the enemy. And heat is our enemy. Yep. Yeah. We can actually, over a long period of time, by using ceramic guides, you can get that blade pretty hot. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. But with wheels, bearing wheels, it's just rolling past mm. it. And on the back guides here, you're talking about setting those up properly. Yeah, now the back guide, the back guide, in fact, is probably the, the most important guide. If it is not set up properly, and with the clearances that we have on the side guides, if the blade, if the back uh, guide is not in place to support the blade being pushed into the guides, we can actually deflect the blade under load when we're cutting and the teeth all have a set to them, a left, right, left, right. And if we don't have the back guide set up properly, we can push the nice sharp teeth right into the hardened guide wheels and what do you think happens yeah. then? <laughs> it takes about that long to, to dull your yep. blade. That's one of the things that a lot of people fail to understand and fail to maintain. So this back guide spacing should be what? The back, I like the back guide, if I have no power on this, I'm just turning this by hand, mm -hmm. I can watch that back guide and I may hear it kind of skip or maybe periodically rotate but again, I don't want it turning all the time. When you turn your bandsaw on after you've got all this set up, you should hear nothing much more than just a hum. There should not be any grinding and complaining and noise. Mm -hmm. It should just, your bandsaw should purr. Yeah. That's when she's running good. Yeah. Underneath the bandsaw. Yeah. You're gonna have a side guide and a back guide. And those are gonna be right up in here. In, in the area that I refer to as the black hole. <laughs> that being said, when it's time to go down there and change those, get yourself a convenient little stool, something that you can sit on, get down nice and low, get a light up underneath there so that you can see what's going on. We're setting those bottom ones the exact same way. We're setting, setting the, the bottom top. ones the exact same, same clearances on the side, same uh, barely skipping off, off of the back guide. You hear drift, blade drift a lot when people talk about bandsaws. Right. I, I feel that any time that you have blade drift with these new modern bandsaws and the new modern high quality blades, if you're experiencing drift, you have a problem yeah. with your setup or with the sharpness of your blade. I, I just do not believe mm -hmm. in drift. 
So it's either not set up properly. It's or not your set up dull. properly, or your blade is or dull. Both. Or both. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And if it's both, then what Somebody's you're going to experience is yeah, a lot of a, a lot of requirements to have to really torque that part in order to get it to go cutting a straight line. Yeah. Properly set up, good sharp blades, you should not be experiencing drift. Okay. Let's talk about dust collection on these. Dust collection on these bandsaws when you're going to be doing a lot of resawing. You can imagine I'm going to cre be creating a lot of dust. Yeah. That has to be evacuated from the saw. If not, and especially on the lower set of wheels, you're driving that, those chips down to the lower set of wheels and then you're going to be impacting the dust between the driving wheel and the blade. And if you continually do this without extracting the dust, you're going to have a buildup. And if, as you get a buildup, you're probably going to start affecting your tracking. And if you, st if you lose your proper tracking, you're also going to lose the relationship between the blade and the back guide. It may come out or it may go in. Dust collection on these is imperative. These newer bandsaws now have two dust ports on them, one at the lower end for collecting anything that gets to the bottom of the, of the compartment, and then one just directly below where the blade passes through the table. That's the one that you should focus on the most. That's the one that's getting it before it gets yeah, down. That's right. Shop vacs typically do not do a, a sufficient job of extracting the dust. They're not, they don't have enough pull. They just don't have enough volume of air mm -hmm. to get that dust away. In your owner's manual, they will actually tell you this bandsaw requires 350, 400, I don't know what the exact number is, but it's somewhere in that vicinity of CFM, of air flowing through there to successfully extract the dust. So wasn't worth it. You, you, really need to, you really need to own up to that. Yeah. Now, you can find some small little single stage dust collectors that you can keep by this bandsaw if you have minimal tools in your shop, or if you have a shop piped up like we do here in, the, in our shop to a central system. You can see we're, we're on a trunk line and we have the benefits of a big three horsepower central system, which really does a good job of removing that dust. Certainly the other thing is an environmental thing. You just right. don't want to have all that dust floating around. Yeah, because this is going to create a lot of fine dust. Very, very fine dust. It doesn't really create chips like, like if you were turning or planing or sawing. It creates very, very fine chips. What I want, what I want to do is I want to make a couple different kinds of cuts. I want to make a cut with the the fence lying down low, okay. a very thin, very thin piece. We'll just make a quick little cut. And then we're going to go ahead and stand the fence up. And then we're going to kind of show where this, these bandsaws shine okay. in so, making a nice thin piece of, thin piece of uh, cut. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and lock that column in place. I have a scale on my table, which will allow me to make a specific width cut. And let's just set it at one inch. I'm going to lock it down in place. Put my safety glasses on. Turn on my saw. And I'm just going to gradually feed this through. Now here's one of the advantages of a bandsaw. There's no other tool in the shop where you can stop and actually have to let go of the piece for whatever reason. I don't recommend this, but I just want to make this, this point. You can't do that on a table saw because as soon as you let go of that piece, it's going across the shop. But here, I can start and stop anytime I want. I can back up and nothing drastic or dramatic happens. There's my work piece. There's my piece. So Matt, you can see we've got a pretty good finish on there. That was with that real coarse carbide blade on a piece of dried old oak. 
The other great thing about this bandsaw is that unlike any other piece, I can take a piece of wood like this and start cutting it up. There's no other tool in the shop that I can use other than the bandsaw to, to do whatever process I want to do to a little branch. This is a little piece of mesquite. So it's probably going to turn into a really nice handle. We showed you this one before. Here again, this is some uh, spalted pecan. Again, it may make some nice detail parts for a project that you want. But again, you have to use the bandsaw in order to process this. All right, so now we've made that cut on small pieces. I could have a piece of wood that say I want to cut a diagonal line across. Now I'm going to freehand this. I'm going to position myself behind the blade. Again, another one of those instances where you never position yourself behind the blade on a table saw for fear of kickback, right? Right. Here, and I'm just going to follow that line. So there, again, a random curved line, it could be a straight line or whatever, but again, I could do that on a table saw, but I'd have to go through a lot of setup. Right. Here I just have my line, cut it. Yep. So let's show off a little bit. <laughs> so let's cut a nice little piece of veneer about, about that thick. And again, I want to bring my guides down as close as possible. So that I can make sure that this will go all the way through. Lock it in place. Now I'm going to use a, a gripper tool that has what they call their gravity heel on it. So that when I have this board in here, the gripper heel will push the board through. You see that? But yet it keeps my hand. I don't want to be doing this. Let's start up the bandsaw. On this process, I want to create a sandwich. I want to put as much pressure supporting the fence as I am using to push the, the part against the fence. Because if I push with one way or the other, I'm, I am going to deflect that fence. There's just no two ways about it. And I don't want to do that. So, a very steady, So again, if I needed to, I could stop. I'm not forcing the blade, I'm just letting it tell me how fast I can push it through. Ready to come out. And we're done. So you see we got a little grain here. Now watch what happens when we open it up. We've got that that proverbial book match yeah, it's pretty. of the grain. It's pretty smooth too. And smooth, yeah. There's would require very little sanding. I mean, you can see where I stopped. Yeah. But as far as that, the rest of it. That's easily 100, 120 grit. And that's really thin too. And that's thin. What, so we're about an eight, that's maybe about an eight. Yeah, yeah. We were cutting with this three quarter inch wide blade. This bandsaw is fitted with a three eighths wide blade. And I just want to demonstrate briefly some of the capabilities when you have a much narrower blade. So I just have a piece of three quarter inch stock here of a piece of maple that I found in the shop. And I just want to show you that with the narrower blade, how much tighter of a curve I can cut. So again, the same process applies. I'm going to lower my 
guide system down to just above the workpiece. And in this instance, I'm going to just do this freehand. The thing that there's something very special about cutting curves, and I'll demonstrate what happens. But the process is, when you're cutting a curved piece, you want to be cutting the curve and moving through the blade at the same time. This is not just a one-dimension cut. This is actually a two-dimension cut where I cannot stop, turn, stop, yeah. like this, because I'll show you what happened. And this takes practice. You need to learn to, to move forward and to move your cut at the same time. It's analogous to driving your car. You look down the road, you look ahead of your, where you want to go in order to make sure you get there in a nice right. straight way. You're going to want to do the same thing here. You need to anticipate your cut a little bit. So I'm just going to enter this piece. Now, watch what happens if I just advance it, then twist the blade. Twist the blade. See how it doesn't cut? Yeah. See, see how it's binding the saw? But if I continue to turn and advance the curve, Again, my, my foot brake stop. So there was my curve. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Again, pretty smooth. A few little burn marks to be expected. Right. Thank you, Mr. D, for having us here in the shop. Right. If you're interested in taking a class from Mr. D and learning how to get to be a professional level like <laughs> he is on the van saw, come see him here at Woodcraft on the south side of Houston. He has regular classes here. We have a, a van saw 101 class every month. Uh, we go through a lot of just exactly what we did here on the video today, but it's very hands-on for you. Right. That's where you're really going to learn is when you get your hands yep. on this stuff. Yep. Uh, I'll put a link in the description below to the list of classes that are available here at this location. You can go check it out. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. If you like this video, go check out the 10 tips to better hand cut dovetails we did at Woodcraft North here in Houston. Click that box right there. Click in the box, get you the big old virtual fist bump. Also, another one of my favorite videos right there.